Thanks, David, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks, Heather, for inviting me and to the rest of the MSSI people for the kind invitation to the final uh, seminar in the series. Uh, Heather said that because it's uh, the nearly the holiday period, I should feel free to make this fun. I can't think of anything more fun than New City, so it's already inherently going to be fun. Um, Okay, a little outline of what I'm going to be talking about in the next 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce the New Cities phenomenon uh, in general uh, and talk about some of the drivers of the New Cities phenomenon. Um, I'll highlight some of the broad trends. Of course, this is a very nutshell version because it's a huge and sprawling topic. Uh, and then I'll turn to uh, several New Cities and, uh, that I've been to and have published on uh, and how We'll examine how new cities uh, are used as political tools, uh, looking at Putrajaya in Malaysia, King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia, and Forest City in Malaysia. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a few thoughts on when we will hit peak new cities. Okay, uh, a lot of people, when I go to conferences and give talks in different places, uh, like to point out that new cities are not new. Uh, and they like to point to post-World War II examples of Chandigarh and Brasilia. I like to counterpoint out that new master plan cities built from a tabula rasa have been built for thousands of years in a variety of ancient empires, including uh, Mayan empires, Chinese, Greek, various Hindu empires, including European colonial uh, empires. Conquerors since Alexander the Great have seen the strategic and cultural advantages of establishing their own cities across the world. Uh, but as the first modern industrial power, Britain has been the chief exporter of municipalities and through the agency of her empire broadcast them everywhere. Half the cities of the American East owe their genesis to the British Empire. Most of the cities in Canada, many of the cities in Africa, all the cities of Australasia and the tremendous city-states of Singapore and Hong Kong. Aside from the English language, urbanism was the most lasting of the British imperial legacies. Uh, and this legacy can be found in many new cities today, as we will look at. So fast forward to the post-war era when many countries were gaining independence and looking for an urban expression of their national aspirations. Some of the features of new city projects at that time were that they were state-driven and state-financed uh, projects with no private sector involvement at all. So funding for these projects, such as Chandigarh and Brasilia, the most famous of the new cities projects from the 60s, came from international NGOs, uh, international governments, and the government of the host country. Um, oftentimes, they use international modernism to showcase their modern aspirations. Uh, and these projects tended to be fused with some socialist uh, ideas and at least aimed to be inclusive. So let's do a little comparison between uh, the cities of the you know, 50 to 100 years ago and today. Uh, the key actors involved, including architecture firms, planning firms, investors, etc of the older generation of new cities were primarily from Western Europe and the US. And you can see today there are all sorts of new players involved on the scene. Um, we have new actors from Asia, from South Korea, uh, Malaysia, uh, China, uh, Singapore, and also new uh, patterns of exploitative relationships. We're seeing new networks through which urban ideas are circulated. Uh, the global north no longer has a monopoly on urban expertise. So some of the fascinating patterns I've seen are uh, a new city in Ecuador that I'm doing research on is actually patterned after a South Korean new city. Uh, Malaysia has become a tremendous exporter of urban ideas uh, and has exported their, the Malaysian model around Southeast Asia, around Asia, and into Africa. Uh, Morocco is now advising cities, new city projects in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so it's a sort of an open field now. The text is extremely small on this, uh, which indicates the problems I'm having in actually visualizing and mapping this huge phenomenon. Um, so this is a, uh, the most up-to-date map I've done of um, all the new city projects underway. 
The host countries uh, are highlighted in yellow, and you can see the yellow starting to take over. Um, there's between 110 and 150 new city projects underway in over 40 countries now. So as you can see, this is a phenomenon occurring uh, almost exclusively outside the global north in emerging or transitioning economies. So this is a photo of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, and it's pretty representative of the kind of congestion found in cities worldwide. Uh, to many residents, conditions in their cities feel quite hopeless. Um, to many residents of mega cities and other cities in the global south, conditions are deteriorating. Uh, they feel that the problems are overwhelming uh, and they're saddled with ineffective bureaucracies that are unable or unwilling to make substantive improvements. So the notion of creating a new city from scratch that will provide a clean and green and safe and beautiful environment is incredibly appealing. It's also incredibly seductive to policymakers and residents. Okay, so it's important to differentiate between the official and unofficial uh, rationales offered by new cities advocates. Officially, new cities are rationalized as a key way for countries or regions to leapfrog their economies from the production of raw materials or light manufacturing into the digital age and to foster uh, the much coveted knowledge economy. New city projects are sold as a way to quickly address the many problems that plague uh, cities in the global south, including housing shortages, pollution, congestion, sprawl, and so on. They're also seen as job creation strategies that will attract industries, particularly as nearly half of new cities are part of broad, uh, uh, broader special economic zones. New cities are also a strategy for nation building, uh, for crafting identity, and for rebranding the national image. So are you an oil producing nation? Why not create an eco city to change your image and create some buzz? New cities are also seen as a part of a, a development that former colonies feel that they deserve to have uh, as a way to address the humiliation and the legacy of colonialism. So uh, just a few days ago, I was reading the newspaper and I saw a great quote, very representative quote from Egypt's president uh, when he was asked about a new capital city project that is underway or in the planning stages that will replace Cairo as the national capital. He said, isn't it our right to have a dream? Don't we deserve this? Uh, and similarly, a Nigerian leader also recently argued with critics of Nigeria's new cities, saying, does Africa not deserve its shiny new cities? So this is sort of seen as, or at least sold as something that is the developing world's due. Okay, and on to unofficial um, drivers of new city projects. Investors are looking for uh, investment vehicles for trillions of dollars right now. Um, and so new cities are seen as sort of an opportunity potentially to park that investment those investment dollars. Uh, real estate, of course, we all know, uh, is increasingly becoming a key investment vehicle. And the rush to create new cities can be seen in part as an attempt to provide more real estate to hungry investors. Uh, technology companies also see huge opportunities to profit from new cities. The CEO of Cisco estimates that they stand to make at least $400 billion from new cities projects in the coming decades. Uh, new cities are viewed by many builders as catalysts for social change. So from experiments in social liberalism, which we will see in Saudi Arabia, to weapons of eth ethno-nationalism, which we will see in Malaysia. Okay, some of the new city trends. This is a whistle-stop tour through uh, a very complicated and huge topic. Uh, first of all, we're looking at the, corporate, the growing corporatization of urban space. Um, the role of corporations is something new from the last several uh, decades. This was not present in Brasilia and Chandigarh and the sort of 1960s 
um, versions of new cities. 100% of new cities uh, have CEOs, not mayors. They don't have elected you know, city councils. Uh, it's completely, the, the new cities are completely structured in a corporate model. And it's not hard to guess <laughs> that 100% of these CEOs of new cities are men. Uh, and so we have a very uh, techno-utopian environment uh, where technology is sort of fetishized, which it, and, and the tech sector is very male-dominated as well. The urban sector is very uh, male-dominated. Uh, and put it all together, and this is an incredibly uh, masculine discipline. <laughs> Um, okay, so what we're seeing, the growing role of the private sector, all sorts of new creative types of public-private partnerships. Uh, some scholars have anticipated that uh, n nations are weakening, national borders are disintegrating. Um, and I would argue that in, at least in the context that I study, this is not entirely the case. They're actually being strengthened by projects like this and have sort of a mutual win-win uh, kind of relationship with uh, the private sector. Uh, we're also seeing the subversion of democratic processes um, and sweetheart deals between companies and governments. And this is starting to flare up more and more in countries like India, which are more democratic than others. Um, one meeting that I attended of uh, some new CEOs of new cities, they basically had as one theme of the agenda was how do we circumvent democratic processes? Uh, and they get together and share tactics. Um, so one quote was, my advice, go straight to the top and change the constitution so protesters will be cut off at the knee. Um, okay, another trend, the expropriation of land from the poor. Cities take up, they're very hungry for land, uh, and in order to acquire that land, they use all sorts of tactics. Um, and colonial eminent domain laws are one such tactic used in the former, former colonial world. So similar versions of colonial laws are being used in Malaysia, in Africa, in India. Um, and this is sort of a whole other branch of study uh, as to the legal mechanisms here that facilitate the acquisition of large tracts of land. This is resulting in increasing poverty and homelessness. So the stated goal of these new cities uh, is to address housing deficits, but many of these new cities are actually f uh, leading to greater housing insecurity. Um, the people who lived on that land before, they're not necessarily the people who are welcome to move to these new cities uh, because they're looking for a different uh, demographic. Okay, another trend that I'm starting to detect with these new cities is the lack of international standards uh, in terms of the laborers uh, and the global labor pool. Um, what we're looking at right here is a worker camp located about 15 minutes drive from the Prime Minister's office in Malaysia, uh, in sort of a no man's land between Putrajaya, Malaysia's new capital, and Cyberjaya, Malaysia's Silicon Valley, uh, new tech city. Uh, and in this sort of no man's land is a massive gated compound of shipping containers uh, filled with the people who are constructing both of the cities. And so the estimate it's not clear, I've never actually read anything about this, I just happened to weasel my way into this worker compound. Uh, and the workers themselves estimate that there's between eight and 10,000 people living there. And I have no way to verify that. Um, but they, they counted, the workers were counting how many nationalities they're all, all the, the or, or, country of origin that they're all from. And they got up to about 14. So it's sort of the, they, they call it the UN of uh, refugees living in this worker camp. So these living conditions are increasingly hidden from view. Um, you can visit these very sparkling uh, modern green cities um, and not see anything about the living conditions of the people building them. Uh, and the workers tend to be foreign almost 100% in the case of uh, my case studies, which means they're highly vulnerable and they submit their passports to their boss and 
often don't get paid on time, they work in dangerous conditions, and so on. Okay, one of the fascinating trends is that new cities in sort of the 90s, uh, even some new cities today, tended to look like office parks or very placeless, corporate kind of cities. Uh, and one of the trends that I'm starting to see is that builders of new cities are looking beyond the West for sources of inspiration. So they're looking into sort of a local, authentic um, sensibility. So Malaysia is one of the pioneers in this, um, but other state capitals have also tried to reach into their past, find inspiration in their indigenous uh, architectural heritage and project that in the new cities. So this is just a bit of a comparison. Uh, Gujarat International Finance Tech City, it's very much sort of the shiny mirror glass office park model. And then you compare that with Putrajaya, which is very much sort of going for an Islamic city model. Um, this is a good representative of the dangerous conditions that a lot of these, uh, the workers are under. Uh, more than one worker per day has been killed constructing Lucille, Qatar. Um, 4,000 workers will die by 2022 at current rates, um, and that's when they're hosting the FIFA World Cup. Uh, another trend, I had a student do a very laborious task of going to the websites of 100 new cities, feeding it into this uh, program to make this word cloud, just to sort of get a sense of the buzzwords that are most commonly used. I don't think there are any surprises here. <laughs> it just sort of confirmed what I already suspected. These cities are selling themselves as smart, uh, sustainable, green, world class, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, for anyone interested in uh, sustainability issues and climate change, uh, this is a very fascinating phenomenon. Um, this is uh, Sabah al Ahmed Sea City in Kuwait. They've tunneled canals six miles inland so to create more waterfront property. Uh, and this is not a standalone project. There are actually several like this, maybe not quite this scale. Um, but you can see the progress that they've made since 2002 until 2016 uh, is pretty significant. So when you talk about climate change strategies, are new cities the solution that we should be looking for? I'm always quite hesitant to say that these are templates that we should be following. Uh, nearly 30% of the new cities that I've tracked, which uh, of the 110 new cities I've tracked, uh, are built on the sea, at sea level, more or less. So the only statement that Sabah al Ahmed Sea City has made about climate change is that the land is actually higher than it would normally be because they've tunneled the sand out to make the canals and then dumped it on the <laughs> land where they've built the, the housing and apartments. So it's about two feet higher than it normally would have been. So this is underway. This is not Photoshop. This is real <laughs> and open for business. Um, most of these new cities are claiming to be dense, walkable environments. They prioritize walking, uh, cycling, they prioritize public transportation uh, in order to minimize car usage. So we've put together these little gra figure ground drawings to kind of show you the grain of the urban fabric. Um, you compare London uh, and New York and how we know these cities are quite walkable, they're quite dense. Uh, and then we kind of compare to new cities going uh, under construction now. So Cyberjaya, it takes a lot of walking just to get from building to building. Um, this is not very walkable and it's not conducive to not owning a car. Um, Putrajaya, extraordinarily low density. Um, this, you know, there's a lot of green space. You know, 50% of the city is allocated to green space. Um, but they're losing something in terms of walkability and densi uh, density. These are all uh, one kilometer square. Uh, there was a newspaper article last week about Songdo in South Korea, which is a new city project. Um, and they've called it the first post-car city. So, so Songdo is uh, on the left side in the center. 
Um, and you can sort of see the gaps between the buildings uh, and the road network, which sort of shows that it's actually very reliant on the car. Okay, so similarly, these diagrams show the road pattern um, and sort of the fabric of the city. So the, city, the cities that we know, for example, New York um, and London, have a very dense kind of spidery uh, road network. And you can compare that with the super blocks of Tianjin Eco City or Ordos in China. This doesn't tell us everything we need to know about density, but it does tell us something about what it's like to be a pedestrian in these locations. Okay, I had a student do this uh, very nice little diagram just to show how little has actually been built in new cities. So the yellow represents residents. Uh, the, the entire pie represents the target population. So yellow is actual residents and blue is targeted residents. And so over 50% of new cities have no one there. Uh, and they haven't broken ground. So I called them PowerPoint cities because they really only exist in PowerPoint presentations and websites. Um, and so there's the possibility that they could be canceled or stopped or majorly revised in some way or another. Okay, I'm going to zoom in here to just talk about three uh, case studies that I've, that I've examined over the last five years or so. Um, and examine how these new, new cities can be used as political tools. Okay, so Putrajaya, Malaysia, um, broadcasts growing ethno-nationalism within Malaysia. It sort of embodies a new type of ethno-nationalism that's been brewing for the past several decades. Um, and in contrast, King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia, I argue, is a, conceptualized as a catalyst for social liberalization. And then finally, uh, Forest City in Malaysia, I argue, is part of China's expansionism and new geopolitical strategy. Okay, so Putrajaya, this is the, the court of law uh, in Malaysia, which looks very Islamic for a country that is very multicultural and very multi-religious. Uh, the current population of Putrajaya is 80,000, and the target population is 350,000. Putrajaya's population has kind of stagnated for the past while because they moved all of the government ministries and all of the civil servants from Kuala Lumpur into Putrajaya, uh, and now nobody else really wants to move there. Um, there's really no incentive to move there. So they're trying to attract businesses and different types of people, but one major problem is that it is seen as an Islamic city um, in a country that is very multicultural. So it's about 55, depending on who you ask, 60 to 60% 60 Malay Muslim. 30-something percent Chinese and about 7% uh, Indian descent. Uh, this capital city is very much making a statement that it is an Islamic city. Uh, so dogs, pork, and alcohol, the sale of these are banned. Um, and when you compare the national population, 55-ish uh, percent Muslim versus 98% Muslim in Putrajaya, the government and planners have done their job well. Um, they've excluded ethnic minorities, uh, not only through symbolism of the national buildings, but through policies, um, and we'll see a few other examples. So everything in Putrajaya is a very fascinating mix of different buildings seen in an art history textbook about Islamic civilization. <laughs> There's actually nothing indigenous here. It's all selected bits and pieces from Central Asia, from the Middle East, from North Africa, all to make a very Islamic city. So this is a supersized recreation of the Kaju Bridge in Isfahan. Uh, and here we have the Putra Mosque, which is on a very highly visible uh, outcropping of land. Uh, it's very visible from all around the Putrajaya Lake. And uh, Putrajaya only has Muslim graveyards. There are actually no, there's no space for 
Hindus or uh, Christians. There, there are no cemeteries uh, allocated towards to, for them. So everything about the landscape says this is for Muslims only. Um, and so when I've been doing interviews uh, with different people in the city, I've heard things like Putrajaya is a halal city. It's actually not a halal city, uh, but that's the perception of residents, that they've sort of internalized all of these, this politics and architecture, uh, and that's their sort of perception. Um, one quote from a government official was, Hindus and Chinese don't need cemeteries in Putrajaya. They have their own outside the city. <laughs> Uh, and so, as you can imagine, non-Muslims feel quite excluded from the city. Uh, and they have registered their complaints in various ways. Uh, and so, I've tracked one particular group of Hindus who are elite Hindus, I would say. They're contractors. They're movers and shakers in the construction of Putrajaya. Uh, and I've tracked their progress in terms of them trying to construct a Hindu temple. And this would be the national Hindu temple based in the national capital. And so the original design that they came up with 15 years ago uh, was a very typical South Indian temple, um, colorful gods and goddesses in a central tower or gopuram. This was submitted to the government and someone on the Hindu temple committee in Putrajaya said, government told us the first design for the temple was too Hindu and they would not allow us to have a gopuram or tower. So we went back to the drawing board and found a design from the north part of India for our temple. So this was a bit offensive to the population because they said we're South Indians, we want a South Indian looking temple, but we have been denied this uh, by a, a bureaucrat in the you know, government office. Um, a caretaker of a Hindu temple outside of Putrajaya has said, look at Putrajaya, it's our capital, but it ex excludes all of us who are not Muslim. We are living in an apartheid state. Um, so this is a really good example of how cities can be used as political weapons um, quite effectively. Okay, I just wanted to show the finalized design of the uh, temple as uh, you can sort of contrast that with what they had initially set out to do. Uh, this is acceptable because it doesn't have a tower. Uh, and they have, the, the people I interviewed said, we want to warn the Christians if they want to have a church as their national church uh, in Putrajaya, they aren't going to be able to have a steeple. And so they're actually advising different uh, religious groups right now about this, sort of warning them. They said it shouldn't take 15 years for you if we warn you appropriately. Um, okay, the other issue is funding. Uh, there are two mega mosques in Putrajaya funded by the state. Uh, the Hindus have been struggling to raise money. Um, 15 years, they've received no support from the government. This isn't entirely true. They've actually received about $100,000. Uh, but very, you know, not enough to get anywhere. So the temple is constantly, uh, you know, doing fundraising activities. Okay, on to the next example, King Abdullah Economic City. Uh, so I'm gonna call it CAKE. This is the acronym that Saudis use. Uh, CAKE is the first of four new cities in Saudi Arabia as part of the larger national transition away from oil and uh, towards new uh, uh, types of industries. Uh, and actually it's the first of five because a few weeks ago the fifth one was just announced that's gonna be even bigger and better than cake, apparently. Okay, the current population, depending who you ask, is between 2,000 and 8,000. So I just kind of split the difference and said 4,000. We can never really know the exact number. The target population is 2 million. This is a massive project. This is the largest new city project in the world, if you don't count the one they just announced a few weeks ago. We'll see how far that goes. Um, the estimated cost is 100 billion, which is the most expensive one, one among the most expensive. Um, and the Saudis have about 22% of the world's known oil. So if this, the idea is if the Saudis can't do this, who can do it? <laughs> um, no one's dealing with this, this much of a budget uh, as the Saudis have. Uh, so it's located on the Red Sea coast, uh, about two hours north of Jeddah just to get you um, oriented. This is, the si this is the plan, but I'm actually gonna tilt it the way that they show it. Um, so the plan is that this is the size of Washington DC. 
It's a massive site. Uh, and it will be connected as of, I think, early 2018, in a couple months. It'll be connected by high-speed rail to Mecca, Medina, Jeddah, and the airport. Um, and so the idea is there'll be jobs here, a million jobs for Saudis, uh, in factories, uh, high-tech, business, banking, uh, a university, and the port. The port will be about the fifth largest in the world by the time it's finished. So it's semi-operational now. Um, so cake, the, the, the king and the royal family are deeply involved in cake and deeply invested in cake. Uh, it's named after the now former king and therefore it must succeed. <laughs> there is no failure here. They'll just forge ahead. Uh, it's a corporation. It's a very strange kind of dynamic, but cake is a publicly traded corporate city and it's listed on the Saudi stock exchange. Um, so. <laughs> so as of last year, um, non-Saudis can trade on the Saudi stock exchange. So we all can buy stock and cake as non-residents and have a say in the development of that city. Uh, and this is the CEO who has an MBA from Stanford. So it's sold as a luxury city. Um, there are mansions with five-car garages and and sort of a range. You can find more mook mansions and suburban type houses uh, as well. Golf courses galore. It's going to be lush and green, and all that water is coming from desalination plants, which are powered by oil. <laughs> so it's a post oil city that very much relies on uh, cheap oil. <laughs> Okay, just a reminder for those of you who maybe forgot with all the great news coming out of Saudi Arabia, they're opening uh, movie theaters for the first time in 35 years. Uh, as of 2018, we'll be able to go to the movies in Saudi Arabia. Um, women will be able to drive. Things are really changing, but this is what Saudi women dress like. This is the normal kind of dress. Um, my visit to King Abdullah Economic City has really shown that this city is being sold as an economic catalyst for the city, for the, for the country. Um, but the more interviews I did, the more I realized that there's something else going on that's sort of a quiet liberalization. So I've, I've interviewed everyone from the CEO down the chain all the way to residents. And the more time I spent there and the more visits I did, the more I realized that this city's kind of run by social progressives. And they see this city as being sort of a, zone, a test zone for liberalization in Saudi Arabia. So I'm arguing that cake is actually quite subversive. Uh, and they break Saudi law quite routinely. Um, or, or push the boundaries in interesting ways. Um, so there are public economic goals, but private social liberalization goals. So cake officials regularly break Saudi laws. They push the envelope in various ways, and sometimes they get some pushback, but sometimes uh, they actually succeed. So there's no gender segregation in this city. This is the only place aside from compounds, guarded compounds, where men and women eat together, they work together, they don't have a wall dividing them in their workplace. Um, there's actually amplified pop music in public, which is banned elsewhere in Saudi Arabia. Um, the abaya requirements, which is what these women are wearing, the black robe, they're very minimal. Uh, it's actually illegal not to wear an abaya in public in Saudi Arabia. And it's illegal to wear an abaya of any color other than black. So the re rebels in cake, the rebel Saudi women are wearing gray abayas <laughs> or beige abayas. Uh, and that doesn't seem like much from where we're standing, but it's actually uh, incredibly risky and brave uh, and pushing the envelope in interesting ways. Some of them aren't wearing headscarves and some of them are actually pushing the envelope even further, as I'll show you. Women are allowed to drive in cake. They've been allowed to drive for years. Um, so this was kept on the down low uh, and no one was al allowed to tweet about it. <laughs> People get specific instructions that what happens in cake stays in cake. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and the religious police are denied entry into cake. So the family fun day is where a lot of subversive activity happens. And this is a, a, a Saturday, a, a every weekend event paid for by Amar, which is the construction company from Dubai that is building the city. So they actually pay a, a sort of a party planner type of person to make cake fun for the pioneering residents. So then they'll tell their friends and family cake's a great place to live. Um, so this doesn't look that subversive, but they paid for uh, about 100 kites and then got the community together and everyone did some kite flying activities. No gender segregation. And you can see a lot of the women are not wearing full abayas. This woman, she wears this every day, and I asked her, do you feel afraid? And she says, we're in cake. You know, it's a different environment. The religious police can't get me here. Uh, and so the idea is, when I've spoken with government officials, the idea is that conservative people will come and visit cake and do picnics. They'll do family fun day activities. They'll go for dinner. And they'll sort of see a different way of life which they've never seen before because most Saudis don't have passports. Most Saudis don't jet off to Dubai or Paris for weekends. Uh, and they'll sort of be magically uh, liberalized by a visit to that city. That's sort of the idea I get from interviews. So these are, this is a family of four wives just visiting cake. I couldn't communicate with them. I don't speak Arabic. Um, but they were, I, they, I saw them uh, leave in the minivan and they were looking around and playing on the swing set. You know, they, it, it, they took part in the family fun day. So we'll see what happens. This needs a bit more of a longitudinal study to see how it works. All right, the final case study is Forest City in Malaysia. Uh, just to get you a bit oriented, this is the tip of the Malay Peninsula and Singapore is uh, at the tip. We'll zoom in a bit. So between Singapore and Malaysia, you can't see my pointer, but we'll, we'll zoom in again. Um, a new city is being created by a Chinese company. And so the new city is being built on four artificial islands that are currently under construction. Um, the Chinese company is formed an agreement with the Malaysian state to build this new city in Malaysian territorial waters. All right, let's get a bit closer. You can see, maybe you can't see, but the Forest City sales office is here. It's already built. I don't have a laser pointer, but never mind. We'll zoom in again. OK, so here you can see the four islands as they will look eventually. Island number one is about a third complete. And there are condos, functioning condos, uh, a visitor center, a hotel, uh, and a bunch of restaurants and shops already operational. So number four is where the sales gallery is. And I took a picture looking across to Singapore, and this is how close it is. So just going back, between four and Singapore, two more islands are going to be in between. So the view will, will not always be so clear. So between where I took this photo and Singapore will be two more islands. So this is very close indeed to the coast of Singapore. Uh, and Singapore is now in the position of realizing they have a new neighbor, and that's China. OK, current population, about 50. They've sold condos. They've passed the keys out. I don't know how many full-time residents there are, but 50 is a good estimate. The target population is 700,000. Now, they only started this project in 2014, which means they only started to build the land in 2014. It was all ocean. And so it traditionally takes five years for reclaimed land to compact enough to be able to build on it. And the Chinese developers uh, have said, we've perfected a technique where it only takes 10 months for us to compact the land and to build on it. So they're going, this is happening. This is not, there's no question about whether this is happening or not. Um, OK, so the estimated cost is $100 billion. Uh, the estimate, this is what I find fascinating. The estimated full-time occupancy is 30%. So they're estimating they're going to sell all the condo units. And in the end of the day, 
percent will be empty and because they'll be held by people who own them as investment properties or vacation properties or whatnot. Uh, and 100% of the land is uh, reclaimed. So this is what it looks like. It's being sold as a model green city. So they're saying this is a very ethical project. It's a template for future uh, green cities. Um, and it's basically a superstructure. So all cars will be underground, so parking, roads, etc., leaving the surface of the superstructure free for pedestrians. So this is a little bit that's been finished, and you can sort of see how everything's attached and it's many layers of concrete. So they're tunneling underground uh, to put parking and roads, uh, and everyone will sort of hover on the top, like it's, it very much feels like an airport in a sense. It's a very institutional feeling. So I'm arguing that Forest City is part of China's broader geopolitical strategy. This isn't just a Chinese real estate project. Everyone knows Chinese investors are buying up uh, land and uh, real estate around the world in existing cities. We all know that China is involved in infrastructure projects around the world, increasingly in Africa and Latin America. Um, what is so fascinating about this project is that it's for Chinese nationals. It's for 700,000 Chinese nationals, not just anybody to buy condos. Uh, and so that seems a lot like colonialism to me. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm sort of arguing this is part of a much bigger strategy, and we'll see this in the next slide. Um, it's a private gated city. So not everyone can go on and off the island, and it's not clear how they're going to limit visitors. Um, so one of the questions that I've sort of wondered is that if it's run by a Chinese corporation and Malaysian military and police are not allowed in the project, what laws apply? Does Malaysian law apply? Uh, who, what's protecting residents? Uh, in this context, I can also ask, what is a green city and what resources are needed to keep it green? Because at the moment, it's concrete, superstructure covered in grass and some coconut trees. And that doesn't seem like a lot of ecological value to me. So I want to contextualize this. All the dots that you see on this map are similar Chinese port slash cities built on reclaimed land, largely on reclaimed land. And so when you connect the dots, you look at the Paracel Islands and Spratly Islands, which are contested by numerous countries. The Spratly Islands actually went to world court over this, and the Philippines won. And the Philippines, by rights, owns that land. Nothing's happened since the announcement. Um, and China's just building a, mil a military base, an air base, and sort of militarizing that space. So the South China Sea has sort of been taken control of by China. Forest City, this is a very strategic location at this narrow point in the strait. Uh, and then various dots along the way to their military base in Djibouti. Um, so this is sort of part of a broader phenomenon that I think needs a lot more explanation uh, and ex examination. But all of these port projects are Chinese funded and Chinese controlled. So a friend of mine who studies Pakistan and urbanization issues said that the Chinese port in Pakistan now only takes Chinese currency. So there are a lot of very fascinating things happening. <laughs> Uh, in this respect. Okay, finally, I've been wondering for a couple of years when we're going to hit peak new cities, when the phenomenon will sort of play itself out and governments will say, well, maybe there are other ways that we can develop, other ways to use money, other ways to improve existing cities that we have. Um, and we haven't reached the peak yet. Just you know, last year and since 2015, Several dozen new city projects have been announced, uh, particularly in Africa. Um, so you can see since 1995, Asia has sort of steadily created a number of new cities projects. And Africa was a late comer to the game, but they're actually one of the most active players at this point. All right, I'm going to leave it there. And if you have questions, we can discuss.
mentioned that the, um, a lot of the new cities, or 100% of the new cities will be run by CEOs. And I'm just curious, is that definitely in the actual running of the cities, or is that the design and building stage only? This is what I've been asking. What's the game plan to sort of transition? And the game plan is to keep the status quo. These are most of the, many of them, I would say, are located in special economic zones. So they're sort of in this milieu of a, a corporate environment. Um, I can think of a few examples that aim, once they hit a certain population threshold, to turn it over to a regular system of government. But that's a long way off, and none of them have done it. Thank you. A very fascinating presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first one regarding cake. Um, given Mohammed bin Salman's recent power grab, what are the implications for that city, number one? And number two, I was amazed by your map of the Chinese, um, yeah, that one. What seems apparent is that India is being circled by the Chinese strategy. What are <laughs> Indians' views of this? I'll answer that one first. So Indians, uh, Indian scholars and policymakers are worried, and they have the string of pearls theory that they are being surrounded by all of these little outposts uh, and sort of cut out of the action. Um, and China's becoming very close with its, maybe not enemies, but <laughs> you know, neighboring countries that it, it, it has had issues with. Uh, so the string of pearls idea has been advanced the most by India, Indian scholars. Um, and the other question was, how does Prince Salman yeah. and his work influence the well, city? The fact that he's basically done a power grab in Saudi Arabia in the last couple of months and basically imprisoned a lot of the ruling family. Is there, will there be an impact on Cape with regards to these developments? Uh, no, nah, I, I don't really know for sure because it's a very difficult society to get to know. Um, but my guess is that things are just on track. Um, there's a project called King Abdullah University of Science and Technology that's between Jeddah and Cape, and it's the first co-ed campus in the kingdom surrounded by three perimeter walls. It's very heavily guarded. Um, and there were critics of that when it first opened you know, dec a decade back. And one particular imam uh, was very vocif vociferous in his criticism. And this, as the story goes, he disappeared. So they've been very effective for quite some time in addressing critics. <laughs> so this is nothing new. When I see the King Solomon, he's bold and he's sort of pushing things faster than they've been going. But in my view, this is the direction things have been going for 10 years. So I don't see that it's going to affect Cake in, in one way or another. His ambition is Neom, which is the new city he's announced in northern Saudi Arabia near the Iraq-Jordan border. And that's sort of a more high-tech, you know, techno-utopian type of idea. Um, and that, now that he's sort of in power, that one might advance much further than Cake. Um, in um, many cities around the world, they're creating new suburbs, which uh, are running, built on a theme or a specific design. I think of uh, Florida, they have, uh, Disney has created Celebration, which is kind of a small town USA, uh, supposed to evoke nostalgic views of a small town. Um, China and Shanghai, they have a, they've created a suburb which follows a, looks like a, a, a European town, which as not so. How, does, how do these towns fit into to your... Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap. Like, new cities don't exist in isolation. They're part of a broader series of initiatives, urban plans and whatnot. And I think themed suburbs are sort of a similar impulse. Um, the theming I find really, really interesting. Partly, it's just to sell units because you you know, can sell to like-minded people who are looking for a different type of lifestyle or image or whatnot. Um, and so that's a real estate ploy in my view in terms of celebration and this, this new cities that ring uh, Shanghai that have different themes like Venice and Paris and whatnot. Um, 
Yeah, so partly it's a sales ploy, but I think there's something else happening in some of these new cities like uh, Putrajaya, which is a state capital, so it makes it a, a lot more symbolic kind of space. Um, and also the internal politics also make it a lot more loaded when you choose to recognize one group and not other groups. Um, so they're, they're related, but I think new cities that are intended as independent, they're sort of their own entity. Uh, there's something a bit more sort of powerful about this as a branding and political tool. Yeah, uh, it was really a great presentation. Thank you. You hinted several times that uh, while the desire was often to be sustainable, and it was one of the bigger uh, uh, word that you had in your in your cloud of, of words, um, how what what are the date? What is the data really on sustainability impact in terms of uh, pollution? In terms of uh, relying on, on 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 fossil resources, is there data on that? No, uh, I think the most data would be on Putrajaya, uh, Mazdar in Abu Dhabi, Songdo, and I think that's it because so many are at their early stages. And so what I find troubling is that they can make these claims without having to be responsible to you know, the accuracy of those claims. So it's sort of a, a greenwashing exercise in a sense. And we have no way to test those claims, really, except for looking at their plans. And those plans don't look too sustainable or green or walkable or whatever. So I think in the future, there's going to be a lot more work to be done as these cities sort of flesh out. Uh, just one thing before the next uh, question. Uh, in Forest City, the first golf course is opening now. And it's built on a mangrove swamp. So there's sort of a disconnect as to what green is. Like it sort of means the color green, it means grass, and it means coconut trees. Um, but there's really not a deeper sense of ecological function or anything so far that I've seen. Just answered my question, so I'm good. <laughs> um, should I go ahead? So, <clears throat> Seems like we've got technology covered and a sort of a market argument for the city and there's certainly a political, strong political piece, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of cultural impetus other than maybe the sort of image of some sort of culture imposed on the city. Um, are there cultural leaders of any sort that have gotten behind the idea of a new city to sort of take root, uh, move there, um, you know, whether they're musicians or artists or producers of, of media, people that actually believe in it as a place for culture making, um, which historically would be one of the main drivers of city development. And that seems to be completely absent from the conversation right now as to whether culture really exists there at all other than as a pastiche. Yeah, I'm trying to think of any city that has public art that's, that's a new city project. And I think Yachay in Ecuador has some public art. That's probably been the most receptive to. But are they artists? Yeah, oh no. Artists. No. <laughs> We're a long way off of this in places like Yachay because um, the population is only 1,000 in, in that city. Um, but of the more established new cities, such as um, Putrajaya, uh, no, art's not really talked about. Um, they're looking for a different type of resident with tech skills, programming skills, sort of a certain type of creative class. And I think that's partly because there, we're operating in a different political context that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily conducive to what artists want to do. Like it's, it's not, there's not a free press in a lot of these places. It's not the environment to push the boundaries necessarily. Well, yeah, I mean, the whole notion that these are cities, this is a branding tactic. I mean, this is sort of an aspiration. Uh, and I've sort of questioned my own use of new cities. Does this sort of validate them? Uh, they call themselves new cities because it's an aspirational kind of tool. So I just sort of stick with that definition with the understanding that it's a problematic term. Uh, it's a sort of ideology, if anything else. 
Um, from what I understand, there's, there are myriad reasons for why there are different actors involved with different agendas. Um, have you found that these economic, political um, agendas have clashed within the people organizing these cities to begin with? Um, so is there's the political and economic goals clashing. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can sort of start to see that in Putrajaya, where they want it to be a vibrant, kind of booming city, but they've created this ethno-nationalist you know, zone that is not too welcoming of non-Muslims. And so when they say to the business community, which includes a lot of ethnic Chinese, come, come open a business, come to Putrajaya, invest your dollars, they haven't met with a lot of people who want to do that. And so the political ideology often clashes with their economic goals. <laughs> it's one unique example, though, I think, because I, I don't think most of the new cities have such a heavy nationalist ideology. It's the national capital. Okay, so I think that's all the time we have for questions. I just want to invite everyone to join me one more time in thanking Sarah Moses for a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, David.